Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello to everyone in the room and those on Zoom or that one on Zoom. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> we're happy to have you and welcome to Credo at the UU Community of Charlotte. I am Paula Gribble. I'm the Director of Lifespan Religious Education here now, and I will be supporting Credo through our adult programming and spiritual development. Um, this morning, we have technical support from Paul Turner. We will take questions after the presentation. And if you're on Zoom, you can put those in the chat and Paul will read them for us. And thank you to Paul for doing so. Now we would like to welcome our presenter, Joe Hoff. Joe is has been a member of you. You moved. <laughs> has been a member of the UCC since February of 2020. So right. As things yes, were shutting yes, down, right. he immediately joined the adult religious education spiritual development team under the, guidance, uh, under the guidance of Sharon Baker and was a member of that team for two years. <laughs> He's also participated in the biking group, the hiking group, so you get to rhyme, the biking and right. the hiking, right. and has staffed the UUCC booth at Pride. Please welcome Joe Hoff. So uh, I was really thrilled about today's service because I think a lot of what was discussed there kind of matches what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, my first sort of consciousness about Unitarianism was uh, everybody listened to uh, Garrison Keillor's <laughs> program and he mentioned, you know, the Unitarians wherever you are in your journey, right? I mean, that, that was my first understanding of, of anything related to Unitarian Universalism when I was growing up. Um, so I grew up in a large Catholic family. I was number seven of eight uh, in St. Louis, which is many, if anybody's been there, it's a very Catholic city. At least when you are Catholic, everybody else is Catholic, right? That was, kind of, that was the norm in my neighborhood of, of, you know, I had, I knew friends who had 12, 11, even 16 wow. in one of the family, family uh, friends group that I was in. So a uh, very religious family. I had two aunts who were nuns. I had a brother who was a priest. Um, I was um, an altar boy, of course, and a member of the choir and went through all the teen things with Catholicism and all those things. I went to Catholic schools all my life, even through college, except for uh, kindergarten when I went to a public school. That was my only experience outside of Catholic schools. Um, and so that had a big, a profound influence on my life, of course, as you can imagine. And, and I loved many things about the Catholic Church. Um, but as I continued on my journey and, and learned about other things in life, um, you know, I, I, I questioned things. And of course, and, and that's led me to where I am today. Um, I grew up in, if anybody knows St. Louis, it's a very urban city, small compared to like Charlotte's spread out. Uh, city. Um, it was also very segregated due to the, you know, the policies you hear about, you know, the redlining and the uh, building highways. In fact, a, high, a highway was built through my neighborhood on the side that kind of really segregated everything. And so I grew up in one of those neighborhoods they call a neighborhood in transition, a mixed neighborhood, right, of mostly African-American and, and white, right, which was the diversity in St. Louis. Um, and uh, there were African Americans in my Catholic church, uh, as well as uh, I became friends with African Americans in high schools. I went to an all boys prep school. I also did theater in an uh, all girls Catholic school. And I, I, I participated in, in theater there, became friends with a variety of people, um, but of course, all Catholic. Um, and I, as a kid, didn't really understand the situation, segregation, um, until I started spreading out and meeting people from other parts of the city. Uh, and I first, the first sort of border I crossed was St. Louis, the segregated in, when I was growing up, mostly uh, North Side was all African American, and the South Side was mostly uh, white, European Americans. And so I, I made friends, and I started going to North St. Louis, and I I saw uh, the situation there, you know, uh, for the most part, there were nice neighborhoods like mine, um, but also a lot of poverty in, in different parts as well. Definitely disinvestment in some of those neighborhoods, but I never had a problem going there. Of course, you know, that was my privilege, right? 
Uh, I never had a problem. I would go to my friend's house and they treated me uh, wonderfully. And uh, I got to know them and, and their area. Um, and, and I thought that was the norm, right? Um, and then when I went to this all boys prep Catholic school with uh, people coming from the suburbs, I soon learned that this wasn't the norm. And then I was told, for example, if I had a party at my house that certain friends couldn't come because it was a mixed neighborhood, right? I also had African-American friends I wanted to bring to other parties out in the suburbs. And I was told, no, you can't, you can't bring her. Um, and so we went off and partied on our own um, and said, the blank with you, you know, in terms of that. Right. But it was it was a shocking experience because these were my friends and um, I didn't understand why there were these separations like that. Right. Um, and uh, and so I always had a love of languages. I, I learned Spanish was the one that I focused on in high school. And when I had the chance uh, and I grew up in a, a blue collar family, like my parents, I was first generation. My parents didn't travel abroad except for my dad, who was in World War II. Um, and none of my other family members had at that point either. So I took the, the opportunity of studying in Spain. My university had a campus there, and it was actually cheaper for me to study there than it was at my home campus. So I studied there for two semesters. And um, that's where I kind of realized uh, more differences in the world, right? Even uh, Catholicism in Spain was different than the Catholicism I grew up. And I actually ended up going to a Mexican guitar uh, service in this Mexican community because I felt more at home with them than I did with kind of the traditional Spanish uh, church there. So I know I'm bringing a lot of religion here, but um, that, that was a major impact in my life. So I, that's where I first learned how, how things worked in the world and how they could be different, right? Um, and then uh, coming back, I was still wanting to learn more about the world. So there was this great opportunity. Today is called the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, where I could teach English in Japan, working for the Japanese government in there. I ended up in junior high school system. And so I stayed there for four years. Um, I became uh, not fluent, unless I had a lot of sake, <laughs> uh, but I was fairly communicative on a regular basis, right? Um, I compared to my, my Spanish, you know, very different language to learn, although fortunately the sound system is the same. It wasn't like Chinese, which is tonal. Um, and so I was able to pick up the sounds fairly quickly. Um, what was interesting to me living in Japan, and this is where I started questioning all kinds of things, was that it was my first non-majority Christian country that I lived in, right? Um, in when during my my junior year abroad in Spain, I had taken a trip to Morocco, um, uh, just uh, on a side sort of sort because of, it was so close to Spain, and so I experienced a non-Christian country there, but I didn't live in one, right? It was just a tourist kind of trip, and of course things were very different, but I, and fascinating, right? But I didn't really understand. Living in Japan for four years helped me really to get, gain an experience of, of, of working in the system, first of all, because I worked in the school system, and then really getting to know people as well. Um, you know, uh, these are things I, I work at UNC Charlotte now in the Office of International Programs, and I teach these concepts, but collectivism, right? I mean, uh, much, much greater influence than our individual sort of attitude. And to give you an example of that, when I worked in this office of education, I had to introduce the office first when I'm introducing myself. I work for this office, and then I introduce my family last name and then first name, right? So you don't have this consciousness of, oh, uh, this is Joe Hawk, right? It's more, I am working for this group. And then I'm also part of this family group as well, right? Your eyes relating to something else, very different from what I understood. Um, and it's a um, it's a culture of shame, right? Because you're you're it's it's related to that group consciousness where you don't want to shame your group, right? And so the children I taught also had to introduce themselves as to which school they went to, and then themselves as well, right? Uh, and so they didn't want to shame that school. So very different from our individual guilt, especially growing up as Catholic, um, having that individual guilt of, of not um, doing the right thing 
and going to confession and all that. Um, and so uh, I learned a lot um, with that experience because, uh, you know, things were totally different. And I would think uh, in the end, after my four years, I thought things worked well in Japan for the Japanese, right? Some of those, some of their culture wouldn't work here, but it worked well in Japan. And the same with some of our cultural concepts wouldn't work in Japan, but they work well here. Um, it wasn't always easy uh, having to remember, uh, and for those of you who have studied Spanish or French, you have usted in tu in Spanish, right? You have these two levels of formality. Uh, in Japan, there's nine, right? And you have to constantly change how you refer to yourself and others, the grammar, depending on who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. That's where the bowing comes in and the showing of cards because you want to make sure you get that status correct, mm -hmm. right? And you bow lower for certain people and higher for others, right? Mm -hmm. So you're constantly thinking of these all, all the time. That wasn't easy for me. <laughs> um, and fortunately, the Japanese give foreigners a bit of a break. They know that they're not going to get it right. So they, you know, they're always in awe when we do, but um, otherwise they're like, they just giggle a little, right? <laughs> He's a foreigner. He's a foreigner. Um, and so other things, um, you know, Midwesterners, I grew up in the Midwest. And for those of you from the Midwest, you know, like the South, we can be a little indirect at times, right? In terms of saving our own face and that kind of thing. Well, the Japanese are like 10 times more indirect in their speech patterns. It's rude to say no to anybody. Um, and so you have to say things like, oh, that's difficult. Or, you know, we'll talk some more. <laughs> and then you get these, these nuances about what's gonna really happen in the future, right? Especially if it's difficult, that means no. <laughs> so whenever I heard that I knew what was gonna happen. But otherwise, you you try to avoid losing face, as they say, right? Embarrassing yourself as well as embarrassing others. So um, I found this to be really fascinating. I also found that the mutual existence of Buddhism and Shintoism, I don't know if you know what Shintoism, it's the local native culture, our religion, that was practiced, uh, shamanism, some people call it, by the Japanese before Buddhism came from uh, Korea, actually through China. Um, and the existence of that together, there was no problem, right? I mean, you could be Buddhist and Shinto at the same time. And so there's a saying, you get married in the Buddhist church and you die in the Shinto temple, right? <laughs> That's where your funeral takes place. And I thought that was really fascinating. And it really made me question, you know, why do we limit ourselves, right? And why do you limit others, all right? Why can't there be multiple religions with the perspectives from different cultures that try to make sense of life, right? And I know this wasn't the answer my parents wanted to hear from me, but I told them I was not attending church anymore. Um, but but it, it really made me question a lot of the foundations that I was brought up to believe, right? Um, and then also for the most part, you know, I was a tall six foot one, uh, European, American, in Japan. So I stood out like a sore thumb. After living there for four years, I didn't even think about it anymore, but I still did. You know, when when I would cross or go around a corner and there was a, a child there and they start screaming, there's a foreigner, there's a foreigner. I was like, no. <laughs> After four years, I was like, come on. I've lived. <laughs> right. But, you know, and for the most part, they were very welcoming, right? Um, but there were times when I was reminded that I was a foreigner, right, which gave me a little bit of empathy for other groups, right, who were in a similar situation. The other, right, who's the other? There were times when I went in a bar and I was told to leave because I was not Japanese. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this was a Japanese bar, all right? And they couldn't handle my being there, even though I spoke some Japanese at that point, right? Um, and there was a time when I told this guy on this no smoking car in the train to stop smoking, and he did not like that. You know, I thought I had the, I could do that, even though I was a foreigner, I thought I could do it. And he did not like that. He gave me, he said, go home. You don't belong here, right? And nobody else in the car had said anything until after I got off. Then they came up to me and said, oh, don't worry about it, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, why didn't you say something? You were sitting in this car. So I, you know, I, I knew 
I experienced this, of course, I knew I could leave, right? This wasn't my home, but I could leave any time and I wouldn't have to deal with it all my life. Like other groups, others, uh, groups of others that have to experience that all the time. All right, back in the States, um, I went to grad school first in Vermont. Uh, and after living in indirect communicating Japan, I found New Englanders and Northerners very, very quick at everything and direct and it, it kind of threw me off. I then went to do an internship in Switzerland, um, another culture uh, that was a beautiful country, but I didn't find them as welcoming, even not, not as much as the Japanese. Um, and I did six months there, it was a beautiful country, wasn't my favorite place to tell you, except for one canton that I visited where I felt the people were really friendly. So again, I kept on learning more about how different people view the world and treat others. I ended up in Providence, Rhode Island after my master's. Um, there, I felt like a foreigner because of my accent. Um, I didn't say coffee or things like that. Um, and uh, I, you know, uh, I stood out like a sore thumb sometimes. And people would ask me, "Where, where are you from?" And I'd say, "St. Louis." And they'd say, "Where's that?" You know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it was the first time I actually attended a Unitarian community in Providence, Rhode Island, in kind of this old New England looking church. Um, and it was the first time I started learning um, about what Unitarianism meant. I'm watching the time here. Um, I went on to do grad school in Minnesota, where, as you can tell, I picked up a little bit of that accent. <laughs> uh, there, I actually attended a very liberal Catholic church. I still wasn't committed um, to changing. I uh, went on to, live in, to work in Oregon where I found the UU community there quite out there. Um, it makes our community look kind of conservative. Um, loved Oregon, beautiful place, but it was a small town, not for me. Then I first time I lived in the South was in Richmond, Virginia, before coming here. That was also quite a learning experience because even though Missouri is a border state, we never thought we were in the South, in St. Louis anyway. Maybe the Ozarks did, but we didn't. And so, um, I learned a lot of things like the lost cause. I never heard of that before. Uh, it was a little strange to be in the capital of the former Confederacy with those big statues, but thankfully, thankfully they're all gone now. Um, but actually, culturally, I felt a little more at home, maybe because of that indirectness of the Southern uh, culture as well, right? Um, I, could, I could handle that versus New England even. Um, I moved to Charlotte for the job at UNC Charlotte that I'm doing now, and um, after my parents passed away, I joined the UU community here in 2020, February 2020, right? Uh, right before the pandemic uh, uh, hit. Um, but I, I felt finally that this was the time and place for me and to learn more, right? Um, and uh, it's a little odd. I felt that I was being asked to do this because I've only joined since 2020, but um, but having worked with Sharon and the AREST, that gave me a little better idea. Uh, and uh, I felt a little more comfortable. Um, actually, I'm, I'm crossing a new border now. I'm finally being honest with myself. Um, I, I've come out to another a number of people and now to you today as being gay. Uh, I've known this, but I didn't like it. And now I'm kind of liking it now. Congratulations. <laughs> And I can go on and on about that for another day. <laughs> um, let's just say I can be a slow learner sometimes, um, but eventually I learn, right? That's the way I put it. To finish, I'm going to finish, don't worry. <laughs> Would I change anything? No. All of my experiences uh, are using a religious term, blessing, as I see it, right? I've learned so much, I've gained so much by being in the different places I've been. I've gained lots of friends. Um, it wasn't always easy um, going to different places. You miss things that you leave, right, as well. You, you, you hope that you can keep up and it doesn't always work out. Um, but I wouldn't give that up, in, including my getting to know and be, becoming a member of the UU, right? Today's service really it felt like I was home. I mean, this is where I am on my journey crossing all these borders, learning more. And I, I, I say to everyone, do that as much as you can. You know, even in your own community, uh, cross borders, 
um, to, to get to know people who are not like you, right? Um, and that's kind of the, the credo, um, I would call, you know, having known that, you know, there are multiple ways of viewing the world. And as as the Reverend said today, Reverend Lisa, where are you in here? Uh, said today, you know, it, none of them are, are necessarily correct or the, the real thing, right? We can learn from each other, right? Um, and so I'll end there and I'll take some questions. So thank you very much. That was fascinating. I'm trying to keep my head straight with all the questions I have. But <laughs> first, we will um, open it up to questions. And Paul, do we have any questions? You have yet. Great. Uh, with the large family of all growing up Catholic, I'm curious, currently, how's your relationship with your siblings, especially maybe the one that's a priest? <laughs> okay, so that's a complicated story. <laughs> um, most of my family... It's fine. In fact, I, I first came out to them as a Unitarian. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably the hardest thing for me to do. Right? And that was, again, after my parents had passed. There was a little bit of guilt there, so I waited until then. And actually, I think I had, I pulled it up on the website, The Seven Principles, and they were like, oh, this sounds good. You know? But um, my brother, the priest, actually, uh, he's one of those... Uh, you know, every family has one where they may leave the family. He he dropped out of the priesthood and married a woman and moved out west. And I don't know, we don't know what happened, but we don't keep in touch with him. He doesn't keep in touch with us. Out of the eight, he kind of has gone off on his own. Uh, and we're not sure what that is. We hope someday there will be a reconnection. <laughs> what? Join you, Jews? <laughs> Um, and we'll see what happens. But uh, he still remains Catholic, um, but uh, I don't know how. But um, anyway, <laughs> uh, he's on his journey. Hopefully, he'll he'll reach out someday as well. <laughs> yes. I mean, it seems that the job kind of took you into all these other worlds. But even growing up in Missouri it seems like you had kind of an insatiable curiosity of mm -hmm. other people and cultures. Yes, yes, definitely. Again, in those days in St. Louis, a little different now, a little more diverse. There wasn't a lot of possibilities there. But um, I did, and, and my, my father and mother both loved to travel as much as they could with eight kids on a limited salary. Mm -hmm. But um, so we would go to Chicago. Uh, they actually took us to, after more of the kids moved out. They took my bro little brother and I to DC, which was quite amazing to go there. Um, but yeah, I always had this this inkling of wanting to know more. There was a show, I don't know if anybody ever remember, Kukla, Fran, and Ali. Yeah. Right. They show movies, and I love movies, as some people know, um, of, of from around the world. And that kind of started my interest, you know, actually watching those. There was one called The Red Balloon, a German oh, yeah. film. Love that film. So, and and then with Spanish, he would take us, our professor, to different restaurants, Mexican. Uh, there were a few of those in St. Louis at the time, and different things like that. But uh, when I after studying in Spain, that really just made me want to see more of the world uh, because I felt like I could do it, like it was possible, and and just made me want to see more and more. So, and have your siblings since traveled quite a bit? Um, yes, yes, I would say they're not quite as adventurous as me, like going to Southeast Asia or Tanzania. I put that, as I said, I did a, a volunteer program in Tanzania uh, and South Africa. They're more still Europe oriented, but yes, they have all traveled. I think we did get that from my parents that they love to travel, but mostly European, I would say. Yes. Will you share more about what's involved in your job at UNC? Sure. So uh, international education, uh, usually involves uh, helping students study abroad, advising and coordinating programs and exchange agreements, uh, or working with international students um, who come here and helping them uh, adjust to life in America. Could be also in ESL training, English as a second language. My my job here at UNC Charlotte is a little unique in that you know we only send about a thousand students abroad out of the thirty thousand. So we try to also give them international activities and opportunities 
um, at, uh, at UNC Charlotte on campus. And I work with both students and faculty. I also train faculty and um, those who attended the intercultural communication workshop I did you know, in 2020, I guess it was, 2021. Um, I teach intercultural communication as well. And we use that as a way to uh, prepare our students with what we call global competencies uh, so that they can work in a multicultural context, right? Whether that be here in Charlotte, working for a German or a Japanese company or whatever, or working overseas. So uh, that's, that's a, I do a lot more, um, including the International Festival I posted on your website, on the UU website a while back, uh, those kind of things. But to bring the world to our campus in many ways and, and help students gain those global competencies. Yes. So is your job going to help you put down roots here or are you? Well, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I tend to have a five year limit, uh, but I'm getting older, as they say. And so we'll see. I don't know. Again, wherever you are in your journey. Where right? would you go? That's a good question. Um, what, what has happened with my job when you asked me about that is that this became more of an interest to me what I'm doing now than, uh, you know, doing exchange agreements or, or things like that, administrative tasks, right? Um, so I don't know. We'll see. Um, there are certain universities that are leaders in this area, and it's growing more and more because um, in the past, when I went abroad, nobody prepared me, right? I had bad culture shock in Spain. Um, <laughs> And it, but throughout the year that adjust, I adjusted, right? Um, and so I, I want to help students uh, be able to prepare themselves and understand what they're going to go through before they go, right? And that is a, a personal sort of um, quest of my own, trying to develop that not only for myself and my the university I'm working at, but for other universities as well. Think about that. I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, so I did a class and growing up and coming of age in different societies and mm -hmm. we talked about america and japan okay and so i'm curious how you feel of having you know come back here with the notion of collectivism and you come back to this high individualism is that difficult do you feel like japan balances it well do you feel how do you feel right. about that um that's a complex question but um I have always thought that if we could come to into the middle, both sides a little bit, that would be great. The problem is, as I mentioned, the Japanese language mm -hmm. has mm -hmm. that really deeply ingrained uh, hierarchy, um, <laughs> the collectivism, very, very deeply ingrained. And so um, that may take a while yeah. for them to get there. Like I said, it works in Japan, but once they're out, it's a little tougher. Um, I do wish we would become, as today, talking about community, that we would develop that sense of community more, because um, I feel that uh, uh, we've almost kind of gone to the deep end lately, yeah. um, and these individual rights of like owning a gun, you, have, you can't have any rules or limits on that, is just kind of crazy to me. And I, I relish my days in Japan when I have, I didn't worry about any yeah. crime. In fact, one time, um, my bicycle was taken from the bicycle station one night. I was like, oh my God, this never happens. Next day I went back, there was a little note on it saying, I was a little too drunk. <laughs> I uh, took your bicycle by mistake. So I heard that. Did that happen? Did you ever go to Singapore? I haven't been to Singapore. I've been to Malaysia, to Kuala Lumpur, but not Singapore, no. What, what have you, have you been there? No, but I find Singapore kind of a fascinating country. I, mean, I wish that would be my place to visit if I could go anywhere. Right, right. From what I know, like Malaysia, they have these three cultures, main cultures, like Malay, Indian, and Chinese. The Indians were brought by the, the British, and the Chinese uh, came in, as they do in many places in the, in the world. Um, and they have learned how to live together somehow. They also have quotas in housing and things like that, which is just unthinkable here, you know, but, um, but it works, right? It's such a small country uh, where they have learned how to, to live with each other. Oh, you know, it's on my list. Just very expensive place to go, unfortunately. 
Yes. And you mentioned the the contrast in the culture, the Japanese culture to the American culture. I was I used to work in real estate for 25 years. And sometimes we had uh, Japanese clients mm -hmm. that came directly. You know, right. they were not people that lived here before, but to to invest. I was in Puerto Rico at that time. And uh, they just very friendly, very sweet, very uh, respectful. Right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Smiling all the time. And then sometimes my co-worker would say, yes, but then he didn't invite me. <laughs> and I would say, yes, yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, they're just polite. Yeah. Well, yeah. right. They don't in, like in, it. in Japanese, we translate, they say hi, hi. I don't know if you've ever seen it. They say yeah. hi, hi, hi. Yeah. That we translate as yes, and it really isn't. It's more like I hear you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yes. And it's not, again, they're not losing face by saying that. In the end, they may decide against it, but um, right. yeah. In English, they shouldn't use that, but there really is no word. In English, like that, that we say, we might say, um, yeah, um, but we don't really, it's, it's a difficult, you know, like some languages, there are certain concepts, like in Spanish, you know, as well, that can't be translated into English either. They, they have a different right. connotation. So, mm -hmm. great. Thank you nothing, so much. Yes, nothing yeah. on Zoom. Yes. Well, thank you for doing All right, your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> It's really wonderful. And are you available yeah, just yeah. to hang out yeah, in case sure. anybody else wants to talk to him about anything? Um, next month um, is on, it's November 19th because of Thanksgiving. It's on the third Sunday instead of the fourth Sunday. And um, it'll be Chip Diggers. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.